Communication is the transfer of information from one individual to another in a way that affects the behavior of the individual who receives the information. As humans, we're used to communication meaning talking. But keep in mind that you also get information from people when you see them, like somebody's body language and clothes might communicate that they're in a position of power. When you smell them, like the strong smell of Axe body spray often communicates that the wearer is a teenager, and you get information when you are touched by someone, like the old lady pinching your cheek is communicating that she's familiar with you at the very least. Sensory, this sensory communication also occurs in animals. Animals don't have a verbal language like ours, necessarily, but they communicate a lot using visual, scent-based, and touch-based cues, like this wolf that's snarling aggressively, the tiger that's peeing to mark its territory, and the honeybees that are using their dance language to communicate about foraging resources. So how can you tell that some feature of an animal is a communication signal? A signal, by definition, is a message that a species has evolved to communicate something. A signal can be intentional or not, but it has to typically be beneficial to the animal that sends the message. A cue, on the other hand, is a message that an animal sends out which is detrimental to the sender. Like, the animal didn't mean to send out this information, but now someone's heard it and they'll use it. A cue is not a message that the sender has evolved to send, but the receiver may evolve to hear, or see, or smell that message. Let's map out the different types of communication that can happen. Types of communication are characterized by whether they're beneficial or detrimental to the sender and receiver of the message. So for our sender, a message is either beneficial, as represented by these plus signs in the top two boxes, or detrimental, as represented by the minus signs in the bottom two boxes. And here are those same pluses and minuses, benefits and detriments, for the receiver. If the signal is beneficial to both sender and receiver, it's called an honest signal. One example of an honest signal is the distance between an antlered fly's eyes, which is an honest indicator of how likely that fly is to win a fight against another antlered fly. Keep in mind that beneficial doesn't necessarily mean nice. It's beneficial for the smaller fly to know that it's probably going to lose, so it can avoid the fight altogether. If a signal is beneficial to the sender but detrimental to the receiver, then it's a deceitful signal. An example of this is Batesian mimicry, which is when an animal which isn't poisonous or venomous, like this king snake, has evolved to look like a different species which is, like this coral snake. Batesian mimicry is beneficial to the mimic animal, the king snake, because it's less likely to be eaten or attacked, but it's detrimental to the animal that wants to eat the mimic because that animal is missing out on a meal for no reason. If a signal is detrimental to the sender, but beneficial to the receiver, we say that the receiver is eavesdropping on the sender's cue. An example of eavesdropping is if an owl hears a mouse scurrying around. The owl gets information it can use to snatch the mouse by eavesdropping on the mouse's sound cues. Finally, we can safely ignore messages that are detrimental to both sender and receiver because those shouldn't evolve under natural selection. Okay, so switching gears, where do these signals come from? Put simply, signals evolve from traits that already exist and from the ability to sense those traits. This concept is summarized by the term exaption. An exaption is an existing trait that changes function through evolution. One example is a wasp's stinger. Ancestors to wasps didn't have stingers, but they did have really similar organs which they used to lay eggs called ovipositors. This black wasp has, uh, isn't necessarily an ancestor to the yellow jacket, but it has a long ovipositor coming out of its back that looks like the wasp's ancestors might have. That egg layer evolved into a stinger. An old-fashioned term you might hear for this concept is pre-adaptation. Many scientists don't like this term because it implies that evolution has some plan it's sticking to, and that exaptions are step one and adaptations are step two. That's a lot more deterministic than evolution actually is. Stephen Gould referred to the concept of exaption as the panda principle, because panda bears appear to have thumbs, which they use for gripping bamboo. But their thumb isn't like ours. Instead, it evolved from a totally different hand bone, which other bears also have, though they don't have it as big as the, th the panda bear does. So the exaptions we care about here are the traits and behaviors that evolved to become signals and that evolved to become the perception of signals. There is a corresponding hypothesis for each of these exaptions of signal evolution. 
An example of exaption is mammal fur, which stands on end when the animal is cold. Erect fur is a pre-existing trait that has the function of keeping the mammal warmer, and it also happens to make the animal look a little bit bigger. So erect fur has evolved as a symbol of aggression. Traits evolve into signals through a process called ritualization, which is selection for animals sending out some message in a way that benefits the sender due to the receiver's response. If a hissing cat makes you back off, you're reinforcing that signal for the cat. The pre-existing bias hypothesis is about signals that evolve by sensory exploitation, which means taking advantage of the receiver's existing ability to perceive and perhaps prefer certain sights, scents, touches, and sounds. An example of this is seen in Trinidadian guppies. The guppies eat fruit that falls into the water they live in, and they particularly prefer brightly colored nutrient-rich fruits. So guppy, guppies are definitely able to see bright orange since that's on the food that they eat. They have an existing sensory bias to bright orange spots. So the most attractive males are those with the biggest, brightest orange spots. Females prefer males that have those spots. Many examples of the sensory bias hypothesis involve potential mates who evolve to look a little bit like food. In conclusion, communication evolves under natural selection when it's beneficial for the message sender to communicate in some way that helps it survive and reproduce.